Welcome to section 2.8 and today we're covering what's called the vertical angle theorem. And first a definition before we get into what vertical angles are, we need to know what opposite rays are. And the definition is opposite rays are two collinear rays, so that means they're on the same line, that have a common endpoint, the vertex, and extend in opposite directions. So as a diagram here, this is one of our rays. We have ray AB, so it starts at A and goes towards B. If we want to make an opposite ray, we have to start at A and go in the opposite direction of B. So we get this angle here, ray AC, which is a straight line. So AB and AC are referred to as opposite rays. This is not a diagram of opposite rays. Yeah, they have a common endpoint, but the rays AC and AB are not collinear. So if they're not collinear, they can't be opposite rays. Essentially what's happening here is that opposite rays are going to form straight lines. The important point though is this point here, the vertex, will be used later when we talk about vertical angles. So speaking of vertical angles, there are two angles of vertical angles if the rays forming the sides of one and the rays forming the sides of the other are opposite rays. So what that's saying is that if we had an angle or a ray right here, and another ray right here, these are my opposite rays, then when those lines meet, you'll notice that when we have an, uh, an opposite ray going this direction, another opposite ray in the green, these two angles here, angle 2 and angle 4, are formed with the sides of those same opposite rays. Similarly, angle 1 and angle 3 are formed by the same pair of opposite rays. So we have this ray going this way, and this ray going that way, and then 3 has the uh, complementary piece to that. So angle 1 and angle 3 are vertical angles, and angle 2 and angle 4 are vertical angles. The theorem that we have, oops, let me go back to that previous slide, is that these angles, angle 1 and angle 3, the vertical angles, and angle 2 and angle 4, they're going to be congruent. The vertical angle theorem says that, op or that vertical angles are congruent. So as an example, we have the measurement of angle 1, which is 37 degrees, and we want to find 2, 3, and 4. Now to find 2 and 3, or 2 and 4, we can easily find the supplement of angle 1, and that will give us angle 2, because they form a straight line. Angle 1 and angle 3, because they are vertical, we have these opposite rays intersecting. They're going to be congruent. Now I just need to find either angle 2 or angle 4, and I've immediately got the other one. So to find angle 2, I'm going to take 180, and I'm going to subtract 37. And that's going to give me 143. So angle 2 is a 143 degree angle. Angle 4 is the same thing. So how does this work in proofs? Well, we're going to do the same kind of setup we did before. I'm not going to write the givens down because I know that you can do that already. But if we start looking at angle 4 and our angle 6, these are our given pieces of information. Somehow I want to show that angle 5 is congruent to angle 6. So if you look at our, from our given information to our proof, there's one major difference. Angle 6 is still the same, but angle 4 became angle 5. So I have to start thinking about, is there a way to get angle 4 and angle 5 to be the same? Well, there is. Angle 4 has to be congruent to angle 5 because they're vertical angles. So if I'm doing my proof, I know that angle 4 and angle 6 are the same. That's great information to have to begin with. I'm going to say next that angle 4 is congruent to angle 5. Now, they're vertical angles, and vertical angles are congruent, so it's the vertical angle theorem. We're going to abbreviate that VAT. That's one of those abbreviations that you'll want to know. If you're not sure what the abbreviation is, you can say that vertical angles are congruent. So looking at the given information, and then our new step here, we notice that angle 4 is mentioned in both of them. Angle 6 and angle 5 are both congruent to angle 4. So by the transitive property, we know that angle 5 
is congruent to angle 6, and that's transitive. And like we did in the last section, if transitive is the technically correct answer and you put substitution, that's correct as well because transitive is that special case of substitution. Now in this one we have angle V is congruent to angle YRX and angle Y is congruent to angle TRV and we're trying to show that angle V is congruent to angle Y. So something that might immediately jump out to you is what's going on right here and this will be your linking piece to, to put it all together. We know that those two angles or any angle there that forms that R, T, R, V, and Y, R, X, or maybe you call it X, R, Y. Those are going to be vertical angles, so they must be congruent. So I don't see any kind of overlap, common link in my given information, so we're kind of stuck there. But from the diagram, you're going to see that these two angles are vertical angles. So I'm going to say that angle T, R, V is congruent to angle Y, R, X. And you'll notice that when I said that, I'm using the same exact order of the lettering that I used here, just to be consistent and to avoid some confusion. So that's the vertical angle theorem. And from there, I have a couple options on what I can do. If I look at the um, TRV, we'll go with that one. That's mentioned twice. So what that tells me in the next step is I can use the transitive property to lump YRX and angle Y together. Now from there, because I have mentioned um, angle YRX twice, I can lump those together. So that'll give me that common piece. YRX is the same in both, and I'm going to say that angle V is congruent to angle Y. And that's because of the transitive property again. And the last one we're going to talk about today, we want to figure out if this is a possible situation. Could it possibly exist? Well, you're going to say, yeah, the vertical angles, they must be equal. Well, you're right in the sense that that's how we're going to set this up. So we're going to take negative 10x, and we're going to set it equal to negative 8x minus 10. Now, I want to know what the value of x is, and I want to see if that makes legitimate sense and if it works. So the way to do this is I'm going to take this 8x and I'm going to bring it over here. So I'm going to have negative 2x equals negative 10. And I find out that x is equal to 5. Now that 5 is not the answer. And my next step is not the answer. It is a yes or no question, but I've got to justify. So I'm going to take my 5 for x, and I'm going to plug it into here. So if I take negative 10 times 5, I get negative 50. If I do the same thing for the other angle, I get negative 50. And you're thinking, yeah, this is great. They're congruent. It must be true. Well, you set them equal to each other. That's the, the problem with that line of thinking, is that you know that they're congruent because you set them equal to, to each other to begin with. What we have to see is if those angles actually make sense. So you want to look for two things. Are they equal? Yes, they are. And then, do these angles actually work? Well, this is what's bothering me right here negative angles. And we've never dealt with negative angles, and we're not going to. They don't really exist in our geometric world. So our answer to this is no, angles can't be negative. All right, so again, set them equal to each other, find x, plug it in, and see if you have a situation that works.